Hello and welcome to this latest Lowy Institute live event. This is part of what we're calling the Long Distance Lowy Institute, in which we communicate our content and analysis online while we're unable to do so in person. A very warm welcome to the, everyone joining us from Australia and to those dialing in from overseas. I'm Michael Fullylove, the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. What a remarkable few days. On Tuesday night, the presidential election was too close to call with Donald Trump and Joe Biden trading victories in different states. President Trump has been making accusations about electoral fraud as late as an hour and a half ago in a remarkable press conference that I'm going to come to a little bit later. At this point, Joe Biden is favored to win more than 270 electoral college votes and with that, the presidency, but we certainly don't know what combination of the Rubik's Cube will click into place or when, and we don't know with complete certainty that that will be the result. So to discuss all these issues and try to understand what's happening in Washington, I'm delighted to be joined today by two of the finest and most influential journalists in Washington, Susan Glasser and Peter Baker. Susan is a columnist for The New Yorker whose weekly letter on Donald Trump's Washington is essential reading. Peter is the chief White House correspondent for The New York Times. Susan Peter and Peter are also husband and wife. They are the co-authors of an acclaimed new biography of James Baker, the man who ran Washington. And I'm gonna ask uh, Susan and Peter about that book a little bit later. Susan and Peter are great friends of the Lowy Institute Two years ago, Susan spoke at the launch of our Asia Power Index in New York City. Later that year, we hosted both Susan and Peter in Sydney as part of our annual Media Award. And Susan and Peter were also the first guests on my podcast, The Director's Chair. So on top of their very impressive CV, they are both mentors. Now, Susan Glasser is sitting with us at the moment in front of her fireplace. Peter Baker is filing for the New York Times. He's the chief White House correspondent and he's filing uh, the front page story, uh, touching on among other things, President Trump's um, remarkable press conference. So Peter Baker hopefully will join us in a few minutes, but, for the, but in, the, in the meantime, we're going to kick off with Susan Glasser. So Susan, welcome. Michael, thank you so much uh, for once again, hosting us uh, at the Lowy Institute. We're very sad it's not in person, uh, we had a wonderful time visiting with you. I guess it was a couple years ago already now. But um, yes, this is uh, this is democracy in action, folks. Uh, live uh, crisis direct from your living room uh, in the in the COVID era. Peter is right. typing away. All right. So um, I'm going to ask you some questions. We're going to have an opportunity for the audience to ask some questions as well. At the bottom of the screens, you'll see a Q and A button where you can submit questions. Please uh, make sure you put your name in any organization you're affiliated with, as well as your questions. But in the, in the meantime, I'm going to jump in. Susan, let's start with the election results. The New York Times has Biden at 253 electoral college votes and Trump at 214. The last time I looked, there are still only, uh, there are only a few states still counting votes, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, Nevada, Arizona, and Alaska, I believe. Um, Biden has gained ground on President Trump in Georgia and Pennsylvania, but his lead on, in Arizona has diminished. The betting markets have him at very short odds to win. Um, what do you think at this point is the most likely result? Well, you know, as we're speaking on uh, Thursday evening in Washington time, you know, the expectation is that this at this point has become Joe Biden's to lose. There are paths still for Donald Trump to win. They have not been ruled out uh, in any way mathematically yet, but uh, you could even see uh, a call in the race coming overnight or uh, tomorrow because Pennsylvania by itself is enough for Joe Biden to be productive the winner. And the New York Times number that you uh, cited does not include the call of Arizona, which has been made uh, by Fox News and by um, the Associated Press. So, um, you know, I do think that if the race is called in Pennsylvania, and right now, at, right before I came on, the number had gone down to Trump's lead had dwindled to under 50,000 
votes, it was uh, over 600,000 uh, not that long ago. And so what's happening is essentially they counted all the election day votes first uh, and none of the mail-in votes and Democrats because of the pandemic uh, essentially urged all of their voters to vote by mail and to vote early where they could do so. So that's why you're seeing this enormous shift uh, as the count proceeds. Uh, Donald Trump did something truly remarkable today, of course, which is he uh, started the day uh, by tweeting, stop the count. Uh, and you know, taking the extremely uh, controversial position, essentially that uh, democracy should come to a halt and we should just end the count. Of course, uh, he didn't seem to have the math quite right because had the world somehow listened to him and they had stopped the count this morning, he would have lost uh, because he was behind at that point. But um, the count has gone on and there is every expectation at this hour in Washington, at least, that, that it's Biden's to lose. Let me ask you, even if President, if, if, even, even if Vice President Biden wins, um, President Trump has not been wholly repudiated by the American people. He's won nearly 70 million votes, uh, a lot of the heartland that he won in 2016, and he's done better in some states than uh, almost anybody predicted. And this is all despite the general maladministration over which he's presided, and of course, despite the 235,000 American dead uh, from COVID. So this is not what Democrats hoped for, and it's not what the world expected. What does it tell us about the United States? Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, to a certain extent, it, it might suggest uh, inflated expectations uh, were unrealistic expectations on the part of uh, Trump's critics in the sense that it's been remarkable throughout the presidency how consistent his support from his Republican base has been, which is to say it has not wavered mm. through impeachment and crisis and pandemic and economic collapse and you know all of the litany of things that we can go through. And so you actually, if you go back and look, uh, his approval rating is essentially a straight line uh, through his presidency as if nothing much had happened these four years when of course an awful lot has happened over the last few years so in that sense you know we should have already understood and i think we do understand that this is a sharply divided country uh and that uh trump's approval and disapproval ratings were remarkably not only stable but seemed disconnected from any actions that he might take or not take and so uh the result in this election is consistent with that uh, it shows him uh, gaining, as you said, in some places, but overall the story is of a record high turnout in the United States. The votes are not yet counted, but Joe Biden has already exceeded a 4 million uh, uh, margin of victory in the national popular vote. That is a very large margin of victory. Uh, it may well end up being 5 million by the time uh, the votes are done. Uh, he will have had a larger victory in the popular vote than Hillary Clinton. In fact, it will not have been a close race really at all uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the actual national vote. And depending on the outcome in these states that are still up in the air, uh, you know, if you see uh, Nevada, Arizona, Pennsylvania, and possibly Georgia also uh, flipping for Biden along with Michigan and Wisconsin, which have already turned to Biden and which provided the margin of victory for Donald Trump four years ago. That's actually a very large shift in four years uh, uh, in terms of the electoral map of the United States. So I would say, first of all, it shows you how the narrative of election night may or may not be the historical narrative about this election. But I do take your point because I think it is important for people to know Millions and millions of Americans, uh, 70 million, have uh, supported Donald Trump all the way up until the end here. Uh, they're just not going to magically disappear, uh, even uh, you know if he loses and Joe Biden is inaugurated as president on January 20th. And especially because Democrats do not seem to have uh, uh, cemented their total control over government. The U.S. Senate right now is currently too close to call, but so far it appears that Democrats have fallen short in their effort to also control the U.S. Senate. And it may come down to two runoff elections in Georgia, which would not take place until January 5th. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's say that the Republicans continue to hold on to 
the Senate, you know, Biden would be facing a divided Washington and it would be very, very hard uh, for him to enact uh, many of the legislative priorities that Democrats spent, frankly, the entire last two years talking about enacting. All right, I want to come to that question of how a President Biden could unify America. But first of all, I, I want to ask about uh, President Trump's press conference because I don't want to bury the lead. I know that's a great sin in for journalists like you, Susan. Let me ask you about this press conference. A lot of people feared that President Trump would refuse to accept defeat, and that does seem to be what he's doing. In that press conference, he said there had been a lot of shenanigans. He went through uh, a lot of detail of cases that he, he, he claimed indicated electoral fraud. He said there is going to be a lot of litigation probably ending up in the Supreme Court. So first of all, what did you make of the press conference? You've, you've watched every Trump press conference read every Trump tweet. What did you make of this one? Well, look, it is a classic uh, Donald Trump shocking, but not surprising. It's particularly not surprising because he's literally spent the last six months campaigning in advance of the election and calling it a rigged election. Mm -hmm. uh, according to uh, some numbers I put in my column the other day, just since August alone, he has uh, attacked the legitimacy of the election a uh, hundred times. Uh, total in his political career more than 700 times. Uh, he's talked about rigged elections. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not surprising that he's doing exactly what he told us he would do, uh, but it's still stunning to see the president of the United States in the White House briefing room, uh, basically saying, don't count the votes, baselessly uh, alleging fraud and stealing with actually out. Uh, he didn't, to my mind, Michael, he didn't offer any evidence. He didn't, he just, he just made random attacks. He said, well, everybody knows that Philadelphia is corrupt. How do I know? I know that Philadelphia is corrupt because I went to college there in the 1960s. Uh, you know, I mean, this was like kind of, you know, tin pot dictator stuff, truthfully. And um, I think for many Americans, it was a kind of a shocking moment, perhaps to people uh, like me, who've been watching Trump so closely, uh, I think many Trump critics have, have kind of tuned out the president. So they might be shocked uh, to listen to him kind of ramble on in this way. But to me, he looked like a man who was beginning to understand uh, that he's on the precipice of uh, an epic uh, and historic defeat. And there's nothing Donald Trump hates more than being called a loser. Mm. Well, let me ask you about that, because I, I also felt that Trump seemed less angry uh, and more depressed during that press conference. I thought it was very low energy, rambling, down in the weeds, uh, didn't take questions. Um, as you say, it's possible that he senses that it's slipping away. Is it possible that therefore, to take the glass half full, that um, he's pursuing this to preserve face and to salvage a sort of a narrative that he can tell to his supporters as he exits stage left, which is okay, fine, I've lost, you know, I'm out, but it wasn't fair and it was rigged. Um, is that a possible interpretation rather than the other more dangerous interpretation, which is he will really push the system to the brink, to breaking point, whether it's by uh, inciting violence or um, just, just pushing and pushing and pushing. Is it possible that this is how he sort of inelegantly dismounts? Uh, well, I would say yes, but the only but my only quibble with that analysis at all is that I'm not sure it's an either or. I do actually think that he has pushed the system to the brink and beyond, uh, and that uh, there is a sort of incalculable damage to the United States when the president uh, is attacking uh, the basis of the election and leading millions of people to agree with him. Uh, you know, you can turn on our airwaves, thanks to Rupert Murdoch, and uh, listen to lots of people uh, going down that road along with Donald Trump right to the very end. Um, you know, however, I actually do think that, you know, psychologically that always has explained a lot of Trump's preemptive attacks. Remember, he called the 2016 election rigged 
uh, uh, for months in advance of it because he also anticipated losing that election. Uh, mm -hmm. And even after he shocked himself as well as the world by winning that election, uh, he actually demanded and, and set up a commission to look for the evidence of widespread fraud that he had claimed. And they embarrassingly had to dismantle that commission without any fraud having been discovered. But a man who was willing to investigate his own victory <laughs> uh, in order to uh, prove his unfounded claims. You know, again, this is somebody who goes to extreme measures absolutely uh, to save face and not to be seen as a loser to create, as you put it, a plausible narrative. Uh, but I think he's also, he's, he's, the course is not set, right? Donald Trump is somebody who will, you know, keep uh, buying for time. He will always play rope a uh, in boxing terms, right? He's, he's never gonna give up until the last possible moment. And so uh, while there's any hope in any of these states, he's gonna keep going very much heedless of the damage that he might be doing or has already done. Uh, it's notable that he was a man alone on that uh, podium today at the White House. Uh, in past presidencies, when the president was in trouble, uh, you know, he flanked himself uh, with his party leaders and, you know, with his supporters. Uh, but Donald Trump has always been, you know, very much a man alone. And I think that's how he's ending this thing too, all alone. And, and in particular, Vice President Pence wasn't in that briefing room. Is that significant, do you think? My Vice President Pence also tweeted, uh, you know, moments after the press conference, uh, I stand with President Trump in uh, wishing that all legal votes should be counted. Now, that, of course, was not exactly what Trump said. Trump said, I claim victory and I won. Um, but, you know, I would remind, you know, your listeners in Australia that um, our system does not require the loser to concede in order to lose. Uh, and it certainly doesn't require the loser to be graceful, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in conceding or not conceding mm -hmm. his defeat. Um, but you know, he can do an awful lot between now and January 20th. And I think people are still in the immediate vote counting phase of this, but it is a slow motion crisis because it's, it's, it's a very dangerous situation for a country like the United States to be in. Let me ask you about the interregnum between now and the 20th of January um, and the kind of circus that, that may unfold. I was actually in Florida during the 2000 election and I drove down Alligator Alley to Miami-Dade County to look at the hanging chads uh, outside the, that, you know, that, that's how crazy I am about American politics. Um, you wrote about that period in, in your, uh, your terrific uh, book, The Man Who Ran Washington, because of course, um, George W. Bush tapped James Baker to head the legal team um, so let me ask you, I think, I think you've spoken to James Baker, you, you or Peter have spoken to James Baker recently. I'd be interested in what his view was about what President Trump should and shouldn't do. And more generally, what, what kind of legal strategies do you anticipate the president deploying in the next, um, in the next 11 weeks or so? Well, you know, it is a good question. We did speak uh, with Jim Baker uh, just this afternoon, a few hours ago, uh, in part because Jared Kushner, President Trump's son-in-law, had been uh, quoted as saying that he was uh, making calls and looking for a James Baker-like figure to lead uh, their White House uh, legal strategy uh, after the election. Uh, but when we talked to the real James Baker, he was not a fan of what he's seen so far. In fact, uh, this was shortly after the president's tweet that uh, they should stop the counting uh, in the states that are currently counting. And Baker could not have been more clear with us that uh, you know that's just not the way that it works. He pointed out that back in 2000, when you were in Florida, Michael, uh, you know that uh, when Bush and Gore that was a recount situation. Uh, the votes had already been counted, and as Baker put it, and counted and counted and counted. Uh, our point was that at a certain point, uh, we didn't need to recount it anymore, and uh, you know that they never even considered the possibility of saying that uh, ballots that were cast uh, and uh, received by election day <laughs> uh, would not be counted. They never launched any legal action against entire categories of votes. The question was what to do. Uh, you know, the hanging challenge refers to uh, were some ballots improperly marked or were they properly uh, counted or not counted based on the paper, you know, uh, stylus and was it all poked through or not? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's the kind of issue that might come up after a count was determined. Back in Florida, 
uh, the election came down to a 1400 vote lead approximately that George W. Bush had when the official count was done over Al Gore. And the entire election nationally was very close, by the way. It was about 500,000 votes ultimately mm -hmm. uh, by which Al Gore won the popular vote. We're not dealing with a situation like that right now. We're talking about a much bigger popular vote lead in the millions for Joe Biden. Uh, and so far, we'll see what happens, but none of the states are as close uh, as Florida was back in 2000. Let me ask you about the electoral system just as, seeing as you've just helpfully sort of reminded us what happened in 2000 and the differences between um, now and then. Um, it does seem crazy uh, to most observers to, it, this seems a crazy way to run the world's greatest democracy, if I can put it that way and, and still be respectful. I mean, first of all, there's the issue of the electoral college, which which has its own question marks. And as you say, it's, it's it, that, that Hillary Clinton won the national uh, elect, the national vote by by a large margin and yet lost. So that, that's one question. Then there's the, the, the other separate issue of the different um, pr voting procedures and, and processes in different parts of the country. Now, in most advanced democracies, it doesn't work like that. And, and there are systems and commissions that mean that you can be much more confident that votes will be counted in exactly the same way all across the country. Um, is this an area of, I mean, has this election shown up again um, the electoral procedures, the, 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 the machinery of democracy as a weakness for the United States. And is there any chance that this could lead to reforms, whether it's reforms to the electoral college, which I understand is very difficult, or even to have a more nationally uniform uh, system in terms of voting? Well, these are excellent questions. And, uh, you know, even, uh, uh, you know, as a lifelong U.S. citizen, I would say that it's, uh, it can be hard to understand. And I'm sure we will, before this thing is over, uh, you know, find out the 2020 equivalent of the hanging chad somewhere. So far, I should say, there's been no evidence, actually, of uh, questionable counting procedures or fraud. I mean, it's actually been quite remarkable. And I would suggest there's also been some evidence actually of the strength of this very decentralized uh, system. Why? Well, imagine if uh, there was a, a federal machinery that counted all the votes and there was a president uh, who wanted to be a dictator uh, and who could simply, instead of just tweeting uh, from the Oval Office, stop the count, could order election officials to stop the count. Well, he can't do that in the United States because of the way we have this decentralized system. And uh, in fact, it's even decentralized often, it's not even at the state level, uh, but it tends to be uh, by counties and municipalities. There's, you know, just, it's a very confusing patchwork of laws, but it also, of course, makes it very, very hard uh, for any would-be uh, dictator uh, to interfere with it, no matter how much he'd like to. And, you know, I was struck listening to CNN's coverage just now uh, after it, there's, you know, like this sort of one Republican who they have on, uh, Rick Santorum, who was a senator from Pennsylvania and then a presidential candidate, unsuccessful Republican, very conservative Republican. He often, you know, sort of gets everybody who watches CNN angry because he defends uh, Trump at various times. But interestingly, not only did he condemn uh, what Trump said about stopping the counting, but I, I really took note of what he said, you know, when Donald Trump is claiming that there's some massive conspiracy against him, you know, in like dozens of counties across Pennsylvania, there are election officials, good people who are counting these votes right now. And he's saying every single one of those people is cheating him. I was a senator from Pennsylvania and that's not how you do it. And I was just struck, right, like that, he, you know, Republicans and Democrats all have an investment in this system. They know who counts election votes in America because those are their neighbors and their friends and it's done at the local level. All right, let me, let's talk about some of the, um, the ways that this can go in the, next, in the next little while. As you mentioned at the top, it's still possible mathematically for President Trump to be reelected. So say, uh, that's the way the Rubik's Cube clicks into place. And uh, President Trump is re-elected. Um, he probably, he, his quibbles over the voting at that point may, may fizzle off. Um, what, what kind of um, second term would you anticipate from President Trump if he were re-elected? Of course, with George W, you got, in, in, I think most observers would say in the second term, you got the sharp edges rounded off. You got 
a more orthodox um, kind of presidency. Do you think that model might apply to President Trump? Or do you think, alternatively, it might be President Trump unleashed? Yeah, President Trump unleashed. Uh, look, you know, first of all, it is hard. And I do think one of the problems is that right now, uh, and even during the campaign, people really hadn't fully wrapped their arms around the full implications of a Trump second term because it always seemed very unlikely. And actually, as we're talking, I'm just looking, the vote uh, margin of Trump's in Georgia is now down to 2,500 votes. Uh, and there's a new batch of votes accepted, expected at midnight. If, if um, Biden takes the lead in Georgia, you know, this this thing is, is over now. Mm -hmm. um, and that is quite probably more than possible, it's probably likely. Uh, but let's entertain that thought exercise for just a second. What I would say is that the entire story of the last four years of Trump has been a sort of progressively more unleashed and less constrained president as he's grown uh, both more confident but also more isolated in office. Uh, he's surrounded himself increasingly uh, uh, with advisors who do not have the independence or stature to challenge him. He gets rid of those who do. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it's hard to imagine who would want to serve him uh, in a situation after something like this as well. I mean, you know, at this point, Trump uh, being installed in a second term would be such an undemocratic uh, uh, maneuver, right? He would have lost resoundingly in the popular vote. So he would be uh, a two-term president who had never been elected by a majority of the people. Uh, you know, that would just be... Uh, a curse of illegitimacy, you know, that would haunt and hang over the presidency, uh, and likely only to make Donald Trump more, uh, more determined only to serve those whom he saw as loyal to him. So I, I would think you would see, in particular, uh, the hyper politicization of the Justice Department, uh, you know, the uh, the use. Uh, and commandeering of uh, vast parts of the executive machinery of the government uh, for uh, personal ends of Trump and, and those he surrounds himself with, a sort of a corrupt oligarchic model. All right, let me ask you one more question about Donald Trump and then I wanna ask you a bit about Joe Biden. Um, so let's say that, uh, that it doesn't go that way. Let's say it's called for, for President Biden. By the way, you're most welcome to call the election for, um, for Joe Biden on this call. If you see something happening in the back, you can make news for us. Susan. I'll check right now, but not yet, not yet. Okay, so say Joe Biden is elected. Um, what does President Trump do over the next four years? Um, he's not going to disappear. He's not gonna go quietly into the night. Of course, I, get, I think he, I'm right that he's entitled to constitutionally entitled to run again in 2024. Um, what, does, what do you think he would do if he were out of office? And what does the Republican do, party do? They've sort of gone all in with President Trump for the last four years. Do they maintain that rage or do they, do they try to come back to their more traditional moorings? Well, you know, I think it's an excellent, excellent question. Um, you know, there are a lot of people, Trump uh, and his family today, in fact, that's the very unsettled message that they've had for Republicans to try to keep the party leadership in line. Uh, you've seen the president's son today, uh, you know, essentially tweeting and, and also his former campaign manager basically saying, Republicans, uh, if you are got an eye towards the future, we'd like to hear you speak up right now uh, because they think they're going to use uh, Trump's enormous uh, public platform uh, uh, to maintain his power in the Republican Party. Uh, they've openly talked and leaked their talk of him running again in 2024. I would say this, color me skeptical. I actually personally think that, uh, you know, the stench of a loser on Trump uh, will be very, very uh, hard to erase, that he will certainly still command a big media following he may create you know, some new media company or be a part of some new venture. Um, not that he'll go away quietly, uh, but he'll be shocked uh, at how quickly, uh, you know, the uh, sort of rent seekers around him disappear uh, and the opportunists. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm skeptical uh, about uh, how much personally he will be involved. But I do think that uh, this phenomenon that he's unleashed, uh, this strand in the Republican party uh, is not going away anytime soon. And so I think it's going to be a kind of, um, 
you know, nationalist, populist, uh, uh, right wing, aggressive uh, kind of politics is is definitely going to be around, and there's going to be a real a competition also among Republicans to be seen as the rightful heirs uh, of that Trump base. And I think that competition, of course, is beginning already. It looks like maybe we're getting our other panelists here. Yes. Here we go. This is very exciting. Uh, all right. No, that's just a text from my father saying, as all American fathers are, we are more anxious by the hour. <laughs> Please call us. <laughs> All right, let me, I'm gonna ask you another question while we wait for Peter to join us. Uh, let's, let's go on to a Biden administration. So let's say that, that, that the Rubik's Cube clicks into place in that combination. Uh, pre, uh, Joe Biden is sworn in as president on the 20th of January. The first question I guess is, can he unify the country? Um, welcome, welcome Peter Baker. I'm so sorry. No, no. No, no, this adds to the drama of the call. Thank you for, thank you for staging this. Just uh, in. Um, how'd you go with your story for the New York Times? What's well, the lead? Well, we were debating whether to use the word far-fetched, fanciful, imaginative, or invented to describe the president's version of reality. Does that tell you something? Where did you, where did you come down? It's still being debated. I went with far-fetched, but there's some, uh, there's some argument for hallucinatory. Okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to find the right adjective at this point. Let me, I might ask you one question, Peter, that I've, that I've already put to Susan and then, and then come back to the other questions I had. Let, let me ask you about your take on that press conference today. I, I asked Susan about this. I, I said to Susan, he seemed more depressed than angry to me. What, what was your take? What, what, are, what are the reporters in the, in the Times Bureau take of that? What are you hearing from um, his advisors in the West Wing about his state of mind? What does this tell us about how hard he will put you think he will push things in the next few weeks? Is he looking to dismount or is he still on fire, still thinking that somehow he can squeak out a win? Well, first I would say I agree with everything Susan said, yeah. whatever it was she said, yeah. just to be clear. Uh, but look, yeah, I agree. I think he seemed subdued. I think he seemed like a man who didn't actually think he had won or was about to win, that he was trying to um, outline a predicate to explain a loss, that is, he's not a loser. People didn't repudiate him. He's the victim of this conspiracy, which apparently stretches all the way from Philadelphia to Detroit, to Arizona, to Nevada, to Georgia. Apparently all these people in all these places have somehow collaborated in a way we don't understand exactly to steal the election from him. Uh, and, you know, I'm not 100% sure how much he believes it, but certainly a lot of people around him, even if they find flaws with the system and they are upset about this or that, you know, even the people around him understand that this is uh, not very plausible. You, you saw no senior Republicans basically, uh, you know, mm -hmm. rushing to endorse this uh, view of the world. Like Susan probably already said, I mean, the New York Post story said there was nothing to it. The Fox News people said there's no hard evidence. Uh, Rick Santorum on CNN, all that. So you've, you've got that, that already from Susan, but I think that's, that's the right take. Now, how far will he go? I don't think he's gonna let go easily. He doesn't do that. Uh, he's not looking to leave with it with a you know L tattooed to his uh, uh, forehead. So he will continue to uh, maintain that he is a victim all the way as long as he can. Continue every court fight he can, no matter how groundless it might be. All right, let me let me stay with you, Peter. Let me ask you about Joe Biden's um, uh, state of mind at the moment and the way Joe Biden is presenting himself. Um, uh, it, it was it was quite um, comforting, actually. I thought to see that statement he made about uh, 24 hours ago, or maybe a bit longer th than that. Um, he seemed sort of quietly confident. He seemed to lay things out in a way that was almost presidential, if I can, if I can put that. Um, what what are you hearing about um, about how Biden is feeling, and, and about how, uh, and in particular, how do you think how successful do you think Biden would be? at unifying America, if indeed he is elected president. This seems to have been Joe Biden's signature move over the course of his career, reaching out to his opponents. Many on the left of his party actually derided him for doing that. So it may be that the times will suit Biden, but uh, can anyone unify America at this point? Even someone with a track record of half a century, more or less, of reaching out to Republicans. Can Biden, could Biden unify America? 
Yeah, I think you're right that Biden and people are feeling very confident right now. They see multiple paths toward a win. Our own staff in the New York Times earlier mapped it all out. They, they found 27 different scenarios you can get to an electoral college victory for Biden and only four for Trump at this point. So I think they're feeling quietly confident. Uh, now, can Biden unify the country? You know, I, I think that's a stretch. I think at this point, it's a country that doesn't want to be unified. It's a country that is very polarized and divided. Now, he has instincts that are different than Trump's. Trump's instinct is to exacerbate that division, to play on that division, to, to, uh, to make, it, make it deeper. Biden's instinct, obviously, is the opposite. Biden would prefer to, uh, to unify, and he would prefer to work with Republicans. It may be interesting to see a Republican Senate with Biden, because he may actually be able to cut some deals with Mitch McConnell. He won't be able to do some of the far reaching things he would like to do that he promised the left that he would do. That's certainly not going to happen with a Republican senator. But he might be able to work with Mitch McConnell in a way that even President Trump sometimes wasn't able to do. Now, that's, you know, that's even a, a, an unlikely thing. And it may only be just to keep the ship of state running relatively smoothly rather than making any major changes. But it is his instinct to try to find ways uh, to collaborate uh, and compromise, even to the point where fellow Democrats would get mad at him about that. Well, let me ask you then, Susan, if that's the case, if, if Joe Biden's instinct is to be a centrist, and if the circumstances of the election and the, the fact that nearly 70 million people have voted, Americans have voted for Donald Trump, and that it looks like the Republicans will retain the Senate, if the circumstances of the election require him to govern from the center. What does that do to the, the kind of divisions within the Democratic Party? I mean, we have seen that over the last couple of years, most of the energy in the Democratic Party has been on the left. We've seen that, it, that a lot of the positions that leading Democrats have taken have moved to the left and even Biden himself during the primary process moved to the left. So what does that, what is, how, how do you think, what would be the settling point of a Biden administration along this sort of left, right, um, uh, continuum, if I, if I can put it that way. And if he tries to govern as a centrist, what does that do to the squad and AOC and all the energy on the left of the Democratic Party? Well, you know, Michael, it's interesting because, of course, Biden was eight years, uh, you know, the vice president with President Obama, who came in uh, talking mm -hmm. about hope and uh, thought he would make change by bringing people together around big issues. And you know, he left very disillusioned, I would say, President Obama did, and viewing the, the Republicans uh, as determined to obstruct, you know, anything that they would do, even things that, uh, you know, were essentially centrist or things that a large part of the country could agree upon. And so, you know, Biden comes into office uh, wanting to unite the country, but I think he's got to be pretty clear eyed about his possibility to do so if Mitch McConnell is still uh, the majority leader of the United States Senate. Remember that Mitch McConnell would be the majority leader, not only of the Republican Senate, but this isn't even the same Republican Senate uh, that was blocking Barack Obama for eight years. This is the Republican Senate that voted to acquit Donald Trump in an impeachment trial of an offense that many of them publicly acknowledged he was guilty of, okay? So this is, this is the post-Trump uh, Republican Senate that you, he's dealing with, uh, which is an even more obstructionist by definition, even more activated Republican Senate than the one uh, that spent the last few years of the Obama-Biden administration trying to stop them. So I think you've got to be pretty sanguine uh, about that. Now, there was immediate talk, as you might imagine, since the election about, well, what could Democrats and Republicans do together? I do think in the short term, it should increase the likelihood of a uh, coronavirus relief bill, which uh, might shock, you know, uh, you know, your your listeners in Australia. But here in the U.S., we have not actually managed to have a relief bill uh, for our individuals and uh, state and local governments that are really truly in crisis since April. Uh, you know, it's just a kind of political malpractice in our system. Uh, and that was because Mitch McConnell uh, refused to go along with it. So that's much more likely. Uh, a lot of talk about infrastructure, uh, which is something, uh, you know, usually politicians like to spend money <laughs> on things like uh, building bridges and the like. So, um, you know, maybe we'll see something like that. But um, I don't think you can be too uh, dewy eyed about the prospects for some kind of national coming together moment. 
no, I don't think anyone's too dewy-eyed about Washington these days. Um, let me ask you about for, uh, the foreign policy of a Biden administration, because foreign policy is the one area where the president has a lot of freedom of, move, of maneuver, and especially if um, he's blocked uh, on Capitol Hill, he may like to express his preferences uh, internationally. We know that President, uh, Vice President Biden has enormous international experience. We know that generally, He's, he's pro-alliance, he's, he's a much more internationalist figure than, than, um, than President Trump is. Um, but, but there's also been changes uh, on, on the Democratic side on foreign policy we've seen in the last few years. Democrats have got much harder line on, on China, for example. Um, the left of the party has put a lot of energy into issues like free trade and climate. What kind of, let me ask you a general question, Peter, what kind of foreign policy um, do you think a President Biden would run? Well, I think his first priority will be uh, reestablishing and repairing alliances and focusing on, you know, sort of restoring kind of an American, uh, you know, role in the world, basically. This is a President uh, Trump, that is, who's pulled us out of international agreement after international agreement, alienated our friends in Germany at times in Australia, our friends in, in Asia and friends in, in throughout Europe sometimes in the Middle East. I think that you're going to see in Biden, I think, a first priority of just saying, hey, we're back. America's back. Don't worry. We're here again for you or your friends and all of that. He will obviously get back into the Paris Climate Accord, I think, on day one, if that's legally possible. There are some things he might not do right away. I don't know that he'll necessarily get right back into the Iran nuclear accord. There may have to be some negotiation, both with the Europeans and the Iranians. But he will, he will make an effort, I think, to show an internationalism, a traditional internationalism that had been a bipartisan uh, approach in America for so many years, that will return. Now, he's not going to be flexing military muscles. You know, he is, I think he and President Trump would probably agree to some extent on, on that. He's going to be just as interested in pulling American troops home from conflicts and not starting new ones uh, as President Trump has been. He won't be as bellicose in his language, but I think Vice President Biden and maybe President-elect Biden, if he becomes that, uh, will show an allergy to military adventurism overseas, just like uh, the current president. But broadly speaking, I think he'll want to reevaluate and, and, and reestablish sort of the, the, you know, the more traditional foreign policy that we've seen. He will be tough on China. I do think that's true. I think there is more bipartisan agreement on that. That's one area where a lot of people actually agree with President Trump, if not his tactics, the way he's going about it. And I do think that he, you know, will be skeptical of some trade stuff because, in fact, uh, that's where his, the left of his party is as well. Uh, so he may not necessarily break entirely with uh, President Trump on some of that. By the way, we're down to uh, 1,900 votes in Georgia. All right. Thank you for the update. Susan, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you about, let me hone in on those two issues that Australians care about a lot, China and climate. Um, how, you know, as, as Peter said, uh, Mr. Biden has said he will, America will rejoin Paris. Um, how much, uh, how big a priority um, for a Biden administration would be uh, to take a more ambitious approach on climate change? And on China, just how hard edged do you think Biden would be? Uh, there's a lot of view in Asia that, that President Obama um, gave away too much to China. He was too keen to achieve a G2 with China to solve global problems like uh, climate change when really uh, the leaders in Zhongnanhai are focused very um, intently on Chinese national interests. Do you think, do you think, how tough minded do you think a Biden administration would be on China? Well, those are both uh, important questions. I've, to start on climate change, I think absolutely, not only as Biden said, you know, that he would rejoin Paris on day one, of his presidency, but uh, I think you know he's he and his advisors would be looking for a way uh, to tell the world that the U.S. is back, uh, that uh, multilateralism, treaties, alliances are respected by the United States, and so I would think they would make that a key early priority, especially because that was seen as a signature of Obama era diplomacy, and so. I think that's going to be something where there would be almost across the board consensus in the Biden administration. China, there's more of a debate among Democrats, and I think more of a debate uh, on Biden. For example, he very notably, he said he would get rid of and reverse a lot of Trump's foreign policy mm -hmm. decisions, but he has not 
committed to returning immediately to the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That was the trade deal that was meant to be uh, the Obama administration's sort of signature uh, regional response uh, to uh, kind of rising China and to look to a kind of security diplomacy that also involved economic security. And so interestingly, Biden, because there's been such an anti-free trade uh, uh, discourse from Trump in the last few years and a, a, a turn in the electorate away from it here in the U.S. Biden has not committed to rejoin it. Uh, I would say uh, they haven't ruled it out either. Maybe they hope to use that as leverage, uh, you know, with uh, the Chinese or allies in the region. So I could see them doing it at some point in the future, but in exchange for getting something. In general, the other thing I, I, I know about Joe Biden as a foreign policy figure, you know, from his years as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as well as vice president. He's somebody who actually is, is more of a traditional liberal internationalist, even in some ways than um, Barack Obama, mm -hmm. I would say. And so I think you're gonna hear more about things like human rights from uh, Joe Biden than you, you heard at times from Barack Obama, who had a sort of streak of foreign policy realist in him. And I think that you know Biden, I wouldn't be surprised if you hear a lot uh, more than you've heard from this current administration about Hong Kong, uh, for example, and, uh, you know, trying to make the case that, uh, you know, U.S. democracy is back and that it, a kind of moral values-based foreign policy is what Biden's been talking about. I agree with that. I think Obama had a, a little bit of ice in his veins, and I think Biden is a bit more <laughs> yes. hot-blooded, so yeah. we may see that. Now, we've got about, we've got a bit less than 15 minutes left. I'm going to try to sneak in a few quick questions from our audience. And then I want to come back and ask you a question about your book. Um, so let me let me put some questions. First of all, from Deborah Snow, who's a, a senior journalist here in Australia for the nine newspapers. Deborah asks, why were the polls so off kilter yet again? <laughs> you can take that oh, one. Oh, good, I get that one. Um, it's a great question. We don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I'm not a pollster. Uh, I think you'll see a lot of autopsies done as a result of this, if this doesn't blow up the polling industry, I'm not sure what will, because clearly uh, the frustration that people feel over this now twice in a row is pretty striking. It's the one thing I think President Trump said at his press conference that probably everybody agreed with, which is that the pollsters were wrong. Now, he, he made him out to be, of course, intentionally wrong, trying to hurt him. That's not what happened, of course. But it is correct that you know the polls were universally wrong, including, by the way, some of the conservative, more more conservative leaning uh, polling outfits also. I think were off. So I think that you know could it be the shy Trump voter who just didn't want to admit to pollers, pollsters that they like him and want to vote for him? That's possible. That's part of it. It also could just be that the turnout models were wrong, that the weighting was wrong, that they just simply underestimated how many people out there are still in the demographic groups there where President Trump is strongest and that they overestimated how many uh, democratic leaning voters would uh, would come out. I, you know, again, I'm not an expert on this, so I, I would hesitate to, to offer a quick judgment. I would say about the 2016 polls, which I know a little more about, it was the state polls that were wrong, but the national poll was right. It basically predicted that Hillary Clinton had a three point lead over Trump and she won with two points, basically. It was almost exactly correct on the popular vote. Now, it looks like Biden is not gonna be as close on the national vote, but we haven't counted them all yet. We haven't gotten the, the final toll. Right now, I think it's about 5 million votes above Trump, something like that, right? So that's, you know, that's three or four percentage points. It's not eight percentage points, which a lot of the polls have had. So people will have to answer for that. All right, we have a question from Clive Mottram. I might put it to you, Susan. Clive asks, what influence would Kamala Harris have in a Biden White House? And maybe as you're, as you're both historians, you can answer that question by referring to some vice presidents in history. What kind of vice president do you think she'd be? Would she be a Cheney sort of center of executive power? Would she be a Biden a VP, the last guy in the room? Uh, or what, what, what type of vice president would Kamala Harris be? Well, look, uh, you know, it's a challenge when you take the job that somebody, uh, uh, you know, has done uh, and is now your boss, right? Uh, that's always a challenge. And I think that's true here. Um, you know, Biden is probably a big fan of the Biden model. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just guessing, uh, you know, where that is. Look, you know, Kamala Harris is not going to be a Dick Cheney. She has not spent uh, decades in Washington, learning the machinery. In fact, one remarkable thing about her rise uh, is that she's a first term senator from California 
uh, who is uh, poised on the brink of becoming the first woman and the first African-American woman to become the vice president of the United States. Mm -hmm. It's a huge historic like moment. Her. And she really is very um, you know, new to Washington. She's experienced in government, but in state government in California. She was the attorney general of California before uh, she became a senator. And uh, so she brings a certain expertise. You could imagine her being involved in things like the Department of Justice reform, things like that, but, uh, and politics, right? She ran herself for president and had a not very successful run. She basically dropped out before the voting started. So I don't see her as like kind of being a hidden uh, machinery of government type actor, but a kind of political envoy probably to um, uh, constituencies like the younger Democrats in particular. I would add one thing on this. I, I think Susan's exactly right about all of that. Keep in mind that the last, uh, uh, the, the Cheney mm -hmm. and Biden models were vice presidents who were picked because they were perceived not to want to run for president. Yeah. George W. w. Bush didn't want a number two who's gonna be spending all his time Think about the New Hampshire primary and the Iowa caucus. That was certainly what Obama expected from Biden. Of course, it didn't turn out quite that way. Um, and so I think one thing you'll see that's different about Kamala Harris than the, the, the two of our last three vice presidents is she will have her eye on running for president in 2024. I mean, she will be an active candidate almost from the beginning of her vice presidency, which creates a very different dynamic in the White House where you have sort of these two different imperatives, which are sometimes conflicting, right? The, the imperative of president who wants to get things done and govern and the imperative of a vice president who's trying to set themselves up for their own run in the future. And since Biden is presumed not to be running in 2024, that dynamic asserts itself earlier than it would normally say in a Bill Clinton, Al Gore type of White House. Would it also be true that advisors to the president are likely to be more influential in the Biden White House than the Trump White House, given that uh, president all power flowed from uh, President Trump's head, uh, given uh, Vice President Biden's age, um, but also his governing style. Is, is, it, is it therefore more important who, who are clustered around him in the Oval Office? Yeah, I think that's a fair interpretation. Remember that, uh, you know, as you said, Trump uh, really was the, the enemy of process, uh, among many other things, and really certainly on, you know, national security decision making really blew up many of the processes that have been in place for Democratic and Republican predecessors. So, you know, Joe Biden, having spent eight years in the White House, is very familiar uh, with that kind of executive authority. And by the way, President Obama was really even a, a micromanager when it came uh, to some crucial decision making, very much uh, a careful constitutional lawyer type. Uh, Biden might not be quite like that, but he's used to working very closely uh, with staff, uh, also from his decades on Capitol Hill before that. So I think it matters. Also, he has a cadre of very loyal uh, political and policy advisors that he can bring with him into government who are very experienced. And uh, that, of course, is also a big contrast to Donald Trump, uh, you know, who didn't really have, uh, you know, experienced people. You know, Steve Bannon was not exactly a, a veteran of government when he was brought in to oversee the strategy of the first year of the Trump administration. It's probably too early to get into the parlor game of, of which name will be a, would be assigned to which slot in a Biden administration. But perhaps I can just sort of ask you a thematic question. As you say, Susan, uh, Vice President Biden has worked with a lot of advisors. He's well known, actually. I think I think it's fair to say for having good staff, high quality people who've been with him for a long time, like Tony Blinken and and many others. Uh, of course, there's a number of figures like Susan Rice, who's actually become a, almost a political figure in her own right in the last year. Um, but do you, do you think that Biden would lean on old, uh, old advisors that he's very comfortable with like that? Do you think equally we might see Biden reaching across the aisle and appointing uh, maybe even is it feasible to imagine him appointing a Republican to a big cabinet post as Bill Clinton did, as I think Obama did, for example, someone like Mitt Romney as Secretary of State? Are those kinds of moves possible given the state of American politics, or do you think he's more likely to reward a uh, longtime advisors and loyal Democrats? Yeah, that's a great question. I think he comes in, and you're right, we shouldn't be handicapping the cabinet of a president who hasn't been elected yet. So just start with that caveat. In our household, that's been a banned topic. Okay. Um, but if we're going to play the game anyway, uh, because if we do that in Washington, I would say that the dynamics of the, of the cabinet he was going to pick is different today than it was on Monday. OK, and the reason is because it no longer is guaranteed that he's going to have a Democratic Senate, which I think on Monday, the Biden people thought they 
would have. You know, it may yet end up there. They're going to be, it looks like, possibly two runoff elections in January in Georgia. It's still conceivable then, if Biden were to win, that they could get to 50 uh, senators for the Democrats with Kamala Harris casting a tie-breaking vote. But given that that's still far-fetched and he has to get moving on a cabinet before then, the dynamics have changed. So now he's thinking about who he can put in a cabinet that would win approval from a Republican Senate. And that means, for instance, it may be that Susan Rice may be too difficult. That may change the, the calculation about her as Secretary of State. He may have to go for somebody who is more uh, likely to win approval among Republicans. Let's say a senator like Chris Coons from Delaware, he's very close to, Chris Murphy from Connecticut, who's highly thought of. Now, there, is been, there has been talk in the Biden circle of a no senators policy mm -hmm. in the cabinet. And partly that's a way of boxing out, say, Elizabeth Warren would like very much to have a senior position and they would just as soon not like to have her in the cabinet. And if you have an across the board, no senators policy, that keeps her out. And it means you don't have to have any special elections that take a chance on losing a seat. Mm -hmm. So I, all these things are going into the uh, calculation. But I think you'll see a cabinet that does, is a mix of democratic equities, not just his own people, but trying to satisfy different parts of the party, bring along young people like a Pete Buttigieg, uh, you know, that are probably going to be the future of the party, maybe a Cory Booker, maybe a you know, Julian Castro. He's going to be in charge of the suburbs. Well, he'll be in charge of the suburbs or something anyway. And, and I think that you'll also see, um, you know, uh, it's possible you see a Republican. I think that would be Biden's instinct if he can find somebody. Obama did keep Bob Gates, the Republican defense secretary over from George W. Bush and appointed Ray LaHood, who was a Republican congressman to transportation. I could see Biden doing something like that. Okay. One last question from an audience member, from Lydia Khalil, actually, from the Lowy Institute. Uh, just for a quick answer, if I can. Um, can you comment on the different way that the American media is covering President Trump's falsehoods now? Uh, four years ago, uh, much more uh, unwilling to call out um, uh, falsehoods when they occur. But we noticed even in the last couple of hours, major broadcasters cutting away from President Trump's remarks when he was uh, talking about conspiracy theories and, 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 and so on. Um, uh, do you, yeah, Susan, what, what's your comment on that? Look, yes, I think I think it's notable. I, I would say it's I wouldn't paint the media with uh, such a broad brush. I think broadcast television because they have to take the president, you know, live. That's historically how we've you know covered news from the president of the United States. They've been in a particularly tough bind, and of course had a lot to do with his rise in politics in the first place. Uh, and so I think they've taken a much more aggressive uh, approach. Uh, that I've seen before. And also you've seen social media like Twitter labeling uh, many of Trump's inaccurate and untrue tweets uh, about the election. Uh, that's something that's really been new just in the last month. Uh, but throughout the presidency, I mean, again, look, the Washington Post uh, fact checker has been at it for four long, you know, exhausting years. They've documented more than 20,000 falsehoods by the president of the United States. And so, you know, I wouldn't want to denigrate or diminish all the work that's been done up until now, uh, you, we're still left with the basic conundrum of, uh, you know, if a, a duly elected president of the United States uh, is a liar who doesn't believe in democracy, you know, you're going to have a pretty big challenge covering him. All right, last question. I, I do want to ask you about this tremendous book, The Man Who Ran Washington, The the Life and Times of James A. Baker III. It really, it's an incredible biography. It's an amazing achievement by both of you to get this done while you're doing everything else. Um, so congratulations on it. Let me urge everyone watching to buy it. I'm gonna buy lots of copies for my, for my Christmas gifts. I, I just wanna ask you each to, to comment on this. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's nonfiction, but it kind of, it, it doesn't feel like a Washington that we're watching at the moment. Yeah. Um, how nostalgic did it make you feel about um, that Washington in which uh, levers could be pulled, in which, uh, you know, it wasn't all perfect, of course, because it was dominated by white men from a certain class. But at the same time, it was a very different Washington and, and things were, it seemed that, that someone like James Baker could really get things done. So let me just finish by asking you, what, how, did it make you nostalgic? about the about the Washington that once existed. Well, look, you know, we wanted to do this book in part because Jim Baker's story itself was so fascinating. A White House Chief of Staff, Treasury Secretary, and then Secretary of State during the end of the Cold War ran five presidential campaigns. That's like, in our context, that's like Henry Kissinger and Karl Rove rolled into one. But we also wanted to do the story book because we thought his story was the story of Washington. You know, Washington is a major character in effect 
in this book and how things have changed, how things worked then, how they work now. And I don't think you have to romanticize the past or even be, be nostalgic to recognize things were different then and they are different now. There obviously were cutthroat politics and, and, and corruption and, and, uh, and patriarchy, as you put it, you, you rightly mentioned in the old days, but there was a different ethos in which uh, the two parties could put that aside from time to time to get important things done. And Baker is a great example of that. He was a knife fighter during elections. He was he, he, no holds barred whatsoever. But when the elections were over, he would sit down with Democrats and cut deals on Social Security, on the tax code, on the war in Central America, on all these kinds of things. And that's what you can't see today. Susan mentioned the COVID relief bill. It's really hard to see a Jim Baker allowing seven months to go by without a COVID relief bill, if that was necessary. He would have cut a deal. It might not be what everything everybody wanted, but he would have cut a deal because that's what was done. And today's incentive structure in Washington works against that. And that's the, uh, that's the subtext of the whole book, we think. Well, Susan Glasser, Peter Baker, I want to, again, I want to give another plug to this book. It's a fantastic read. I urge everyone to, to, to purchase it, but I really want to thank Thank you very sincerely for keeping this rendezvous with the Lowy Institute. We didn't know when we scheduled it that Peter would be rewriting a, uh, a story for the front page. Peter, thank you um, for joining us for the second half. And Susan, you, you, the only advantage of Peter not joining us was that I got to spend more time with you. And um, you've taught me a lot in this, in this hour about what's happening. So thank you both very much. And we look forward to speaking with you again in the future, perhaps in person in Sydney. Uh, to everyone else joining us for the latest for this latest Lowy Institute live event, thank you for being there. Keep an eye out for other Lowy Institute work. On November the 18th, let me give a plug. Our annual Owen Harry's lecture will be given by one of the most influential political scientists of his generation, Dr. Francis Fukuyama. And Frank may well have one or two things to say about Washington in that lecture. So thank you again, Susan Glasser. Thank you, Peter Baker. Thank you everybody for joining us and please stay safe and well.